So I'm pleased now to introduce our plenary session speaker, Dr. Jean Bennett, the F.M. Kirby Emeritus Professor of Ophthalmology and Cell and Developmental, Developmental Biology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as director of the Center for Advanced Retinal and Ocular Therapeutics. Dr. Bennett is co-recipient with Dr. Albert McGuire of this year's Harrington Prize for Innovation in Medicine, which we announced in March with our partner, the American Society for Clinical Investigation. The recognition honors Dr. Bennett as a pioneer in retinal gene therapies. Doctors Bennett and McGuire led the scientific and clinical teams that developed the first FDA-approved gene therapy for a genetic disease in the US, one for a rare form of congenital blindness called Leber's congenital amaurosis. Their striking results in a dog model led to clinical trials that reversed blindness in children, becoming the first fully FDA-approved gene therapy. The Bennett-McGuire team has since initiated work on a second inherited retinal disease, choroideremia, which leads to complete blindness, typically in men. And with this work, they've opened a path from bench to bedside in numerous eye diseases, giving sight to the blind. As background, Dr. Bennett graduated with her bachelor's degree in biology from Yale, received a doctorate in zoology, cell, and developmental biology from the University of California at Berkeley, and her medical degree from Harvard. I understand that from a young age, she had a driving fascination with the interplay of light and perception, and thus is a paragon of the idea of following your interest and talents with staunch dedication. Let me quote from the nomination for her Harrington Prize. Her work has changed medical practice. Instead of telling patients there is nothing we can do to treat inherited blindness, patients are, not, are now genotyped and can be treated and have hope. Through her tire, tireless efforts, Dr. Bennett has not only transformed the lives of those affected by blindness, but has also inspired future generations of scientists and medical professionals to push the boundaries of possibility. Our congratulations to Dr. Bennett, and here she is to tell us about her inspiring work. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much. Seth, thank you so much for such a kind introduction. I'm just totally humbled. And I'd like to extend my thanks to the Harrington family, particularly Ron and Nancy and, and the whole family for having the vision to establish such a spectacular institute and program. It's really um, something that is, is a marvel and, um, and it's something that, um, that not only physician scientists will all appreciate around the world, but also patients, family, and society. So I'm going to tell you today um, about uh, our uh, foray into developing a treatment for blindness. And I'm going to tell the story at, in terms of the, the many obstacles that we faced in the, along the way, and then end up um, telling you about how this has affected the field of uh, retinal gene therapy and what uh, challenges exist now and, um, and what we can hope for. Uh, before I go forward, I just want to mention my financial disclosure. Um, the only relevant uh, issue here is that, I, that my husband and I, Albert McGuire, were co-authors on a patent uh, which describes this work, but we waived any potential financial interest so that we could actually work on the, the programs. And so I'd like to begin with, imagine what it would be like to lose your vision. Vision encompasses many different aspects. It's color, you lose your color, you see black and white, you lose your central vision, you can't see faces, you lose the uh, fine focus, you can't see things clearly, you lose your, lose your side vision, you can't see what's going on. And imagine this all going dark. This is what happens to many, many individuals with inherited blindness, including the individuals who uh, were in our clinical trial. But there's hope, and the hope is manifest by this handsome creature here, Lancelot, 
who was born blind as a puppy, was treated when he was four months old, and began to see. And um, he lived another 10 years, which is great for one of these large dogs. He's a, he was a Briard. And, um, uh, and, and basically, that was our eureka moment, when we saw that Lancelot could see after one single injection, and that this persisted. We had to go further. And, um, and so fast forward, um, this shows the first child in our clinical trial who's using his blind cane and holding his parents' hands because he can't see. And the same child a year and a half later after his injection where he's doing clearly visual things. He doesn't have 20-20 vision, but he can play sports. He can see what the teacher's writing on the blackboard. He can ride his bike to his friends' houses and, and not be so dependent on his parents. And he's now in his 20s having a job um, a, a social life, and he tells me that he sh sets up candles and shoots them from 100 yards away so that the candle goes out. I would argue that's visual. <laughs> so what is gene therapy? Any technique that can harness DNA or RNA to treat or prevent disease. I first got interested in the idea when, a long, long time ago, when I was a postdoc around 1980, when the techniques were being developed to be able to clone and manipulate DNA. And I was actually making transgenic mice, which you, you do by injecting the pronucleus of a newly fertilized egg. And you, thereby, you can, could change the characteristics of the animal. And the natural thought was, wow, I can deliver DNA and, and have that incorporated in cells of the animal. Why not use this sort of approach to treat disease? And so I, I went to um, my mentor and said, how can I become a gene therapist? He, he had the same idea, although he hadn't run a trial yet. He said, it's simple. Just go to medical school, learn about the diseases, and go back to the lab and work on it. And go to Harvard Medical School, right? Okay, so I applied, and luckily I got in. Um, and there I met my husband, and in the glow of our first successful somatic gene transfer study, that's the birth of our daughter, Sarah, he said, Gene, do you think we could transfer genes to the retina? And I said, sure, why not? Um, but what I didn't tell him is that um, there are so many things we didn't know. Um, it made great sense because the eye has, and particularly the retina, has what's called immune privilege. You can transplant cells there and put other foreign molecules there without having it rejected. There are two eyes. You can use one as an experimental eye and one as a control. That they're accessible. You can see in them. Just dilate the pupil and you can see the back of the retina really well and image it. And now there are animal models, and we know the disease prevalence, and now we know the genes um, and molecular characteristics. Um, and for the eye, you only need a little bit of a reagent. In comparison to, say, the systemic, mus for example, muscular dystrophy, which involves a systemic injection, for uh, gene therapy in the eye, we use um, 1 times 10 to the 11th vector genomes. For muscular dystrophy, they use four times 10 to the 14th per kilogram. So it's a huge amount of reagent that you need to cover the whole rest of the body, and that also taxes the manufacturers who uh, have to generate all this vector. So um, I didn't know all these things at that point in time, but I did know that we didn't have, know very much, and we had to figure all the, those details out. So if we compare what we had in 1990 versus 2023, uh, there were no meetings on gene therapy. The Genome Project had just been underway, and one gene which caused blindness had been identified. There are now more than uh, 280 different genes, each of which, when mutated, can cause blinding disease. There was no gene therapy clinical trial at all then. Um, there were no animal models for blindness. There was a, a blind mouse that people had studied, but the gene defect hadn't been known. There was no way of delivering genes to the cells in the back of the eye. There was no proof of concept, no imaging, no surgical outcomes, no safety data, et cetera. A lot of nothing. And there, were, there was no funding. Um, and now here we are, we, um, thanks in large part to the Genome Project, which has shown enormous progress over the intervening years. We know all those genes. Uh, we have many different animal models because they became candidates once the genes were identified in, um, in humans. And there are now multiple delivery approaches, and I'll tell you about some of those now. 
So we explored these various delivery approaches. And it is possible to deliver D DNA to cells in the eye for a very transient amount of time using physicochemical methods, but it doesn't stay there and it, it doesn't persist over the years that you would need it to persist. And fortunately, the field of uh, recombinant viruses developed in large part in the 1990s, and we and others found that one particular reagent, it's called a vector because it delivers the DNA to cells, is adeno-associated virus. In the wild type form, this has not been shown to cause disease in animals or humans, and it's made recombinant so that it can't replicate once you put it into a cell. But what you do is you take the guts out of the virus and instead put in your gene and the promoter sequence of interest, and lo and behold, you can turn the macula shown in that top view of a monkey retina green, if you put in the green fluorescent protein uh, cDNA, and we are looking in that macula two years after injection. So it stays there, it stays expressed for a long period of time without any inflammation. So, um, so we did our, our proof of concept in the dogs, and shown here are two affected dogs. The first one was before treatment, the second one after treatment. Before treatment, the, that poor dog bumps into every obstacle in its, in, in its way after treatment. He walks around, no problem. And you can see uh, by looking at the um, pupils, the uninjected eye, when you shine a light at it, it does not constrict. In other words, the retina is not functioning and responding to light. Whereas the injected eye, if you shine a light into the eye, the pupil has a robust constriction. And the dogs can learn how to read. Not. <laughs> that was Lancelot, who was made, um, nominated to be mutant of the month by Nature Genetics. So, um, so what is this disease? In both animals and humans, there, there are a number of different characteristics. Uh, people are born with severely poor vision. One of the hallmarks is poor night vision. They can't see in a room like this to, at all. Um, poor visual acuity, poor side vision. They have abnormal rotatory eye movements. And here you can see in the dog, the, the eye movements, eyes moving around, jiggling, the head is jiggling along with it. Um, but what's worse is whatever poor vision they have dis uh, disintegrates over the next decade or two because it's also a degenerative disease. Um, and uh, what the gene does that is called RP65 is it breaks down an ester which allows the vitamin A derivative 11 cis retinol to be supplied to photoreceptors. Without that, the opsins in those cells cannot absorb light and set up the whole process of vision. So it seemed like a really simple target if we just replaced the RP65 gene, which is malfunctioning, with one that functions, we could potentially correct the disease. However, obstacle number one, just as we got this incredible dog data showing that we could make blind dogs see, there was a disaster in the gene therapy field uh, where there was the first death of a gene therapy um, subject. It was a different disease, different reagent, injected systemically, but unfortunately it was at our institution and, it, and there were many things that went wrong about this, including um, improper informed consent and um, questions about meeting inclusion criteria and a lot of hype. Um, financial conflicts of interest and so forth. So the whole field came to a screeching halt. All the funding dried up and um, companies that had formed to do gene therapy went broke and um, all the clin clinical trials were halted at that point in time. So we were shrugging our shoulders what to do and then a couple of years later, one Catherine High, who's a hematologist and expert in hemophilia at Children's Hospital, she was then at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP, knocked on my office and said, Jean, how would you like to run a clinical trial at CHOP? I'm like, wow, it took me a millionth of a fem femtosecond to say yes. She had taken advantage of this um, pro whole problem with the field and decided to um, persuade the people at CHOP to hire all of the great people who were now out of work, bring them to CHOP, and provide funding to start two phase one clinical trials, one for her disease, hemophilia, and the other for our disease. She knew about our data, and so we were off to the races. But um, there was no path. We had to learn a whole bunch of new acronyms, 
we had to um, go to a meeting of the NIH RAC, Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, which wasn't aptly named. <laughs> they, they grill you. They set up an all-day meeting to go over our plans, which included ultimately enrolling children because we knew that we would get the best results with children. It's a degenerative disease. The cells have to be there when you treat them in order to get them to, to be rescued. And um, people had not enrolled children as vulnerable subjects in gene ther therapy studies. So we went through the whole process, um, were grilled, and um, everybody was happy with our answers. And then one ethicist got up and said, well, my uncle was blind. He knew how to navigate the subway system of New York City. He played the saxophone, he was a millionaire. It's okay to be blind. And we thought we had lost it. But um, two families with children with this disease got up and gave the most eloquent talk about how difficult it is to raise a child um, who is blind and all the stresses on the families and on the child and worries about um, how the child's life will unfold. And so the RAC, um, allowed us to continue, and now all clinic, now clinical trials, other clinical trials can enroll children. The RAC has since been dissolved. Um, we had to de-risk subretinal AEV. We did it in animals, but of course, going to humans is another step. And there, I really have to credit my husband for taking the very brave step of injecting this reagent the first time in humans, in, in, including children. <laughs> Um, and so we didn't really know what the risks were. So we put everything we could think of in the consent documents, such as you might not like additional vision, and if you don't like it, we can blind you, which the, the subjects you can imagine thought, well, that's a little weird. I, yeah, we, you don't think we're gonna like vision? Um, another one, imagine telling an eight-year-old boy you have to abstain from having sex for a year. Or um, if you die, we'll request an autopsy. Um, and, uh, and our regulatory consultants all would point at my husband and say, you know who goes to jail if something bad goes wrong, don't you? Well, fortunately, nothing bad went wrong. This is how the reagent was de delivered, and this is a technique that my husband, Albert McGuire, developed, um, that, you know, like, assisted with in the dogs. Um, first of all, we generated a reagent which expresses as high levels as we could by supercharging the transgene cassette. And the a, it's packaged in this AAV, which serves to piggyback it into the cells. But then you need it to get into the cells. And that's done by what's called subretinal injection, where the reagent is delivered in, the, in a, essentially a sandwich right below the retina adjacent to the cells that need it. And that, um, that uh, little bleb flattens down within hours, leaving minimal residual histologic damage. Another thing we found was that sometimes if you put something in a syringe and send it out, you're not seeing the same dose as what you put in as what goes out. We realized a lot of the material was sticking to the inert surfaces of syringes. And so by adding a little bit of surfactant, we could make sure that we were dosing accurately. And now other groups are using the same approach to make sure that they're dosing accurately. There was a lot of there were a lot of naysayers. These are some of the, um, the things that people said to me that I thought were, were particularly uh, funny. Um, one, um, <laughs> actually, I have no idea what they're talking about, but they seem pretty smart. That was one of our retina specialist friends. Um, and interestingly, Caitlin Carrico, who was my partner when, um, in, in a, sharing a lab bench when we first came to Penn, who is known um, around the world for her work in, develop, in uh, contributing to the development of COVID mRNA vaccines, um, said, what about RNA therapy? <laughs> and um, uh, we never tried it, but she was a big supporter. Uh, so another, we, we were all ready. We finished all the documents, got approval to do this. And then we realized, where are the patients? There are no genotype patients in the United States. We were far behind. But it turns out that one of our colleagues, who happened to be in Naples, Italy, had already genotyped and phenotyped her patients. And she said, I've got a whole bunch of them. We'll send them there, and they can come back. We'll also do testing there. So we get two sets of tests. Um, and, uh, and that added further um, robustness to the data. 
And now, and that gave time for, um, for the United States to catch up in terms of genotyping. This shows the surgical procedure. There's a cannula that's as thin as an eyelash, which uh, touches the retina and delivers the material in this blister-like region underneath the retina. And as I said before, it flattens down really quickly, leaving no damage and exposing the cells we need to have exposed. And one question we didn't know about is, um, what happens if people are enrolled who have antibodies to AAV? Um, this, antibodies to AAV are found in, in, in the population, in a lot, in up to 70% of adults. We didn't know um, whether these would hurt. We kind of set an arbitrary limit of uh, tighter of one to 10,000. And uh, then we had this Mexican family that actually drove to Cancun in a, an ox cart, got on an airplane for the very first time, and actually slept in a bed in, in the hotel in Philadelphia for the first time. They had grown up sleeping hammocks. And they had whopping levels of antibodies. So we could not include them. But um, afterwards, we found out uh, through experimentation in our dogs that those antibodies didn't matter. So those people can now be included we don't even screen for neutralizing antibodies before enrolling patients now. <laughs> so we went forward, and, and um, this shows, again, the first child. Um, who He is navigating an obstacle course. Uh, he's first using his untreated eye. And you can see he bumps into things, has to be reguided because he can't see. And then using his treated eye, the contralateral eye, he navigates this course perfectly. Um, uh, avoiding every obstacle, stepping over obstacles in his path, and finding the end in record time. And I'm showing this um, as a preview for one of the other um, obstacles, um, injecting the contralateral eye. We weren't sure whether that was going to um, be effective because prior to that, nobody had successfully readministered gene therapy um, due to um, presence of neutralizing antibodies. What we didn't want to have happen was to inject one eye, then go to the other eye, have any efficacy blocked by antibodies, or worse, have inflammation and ruin the effect in the initially treated eye and prevent any effect in the second eye. So we went back to our trusty animals and inject high dose in one eye, and then three weeks later, when the immune response would be maximal, injected the contralateral eye. And you can see Venus there, obviously visual. And, um, and she and the other dogs um, shown uh, up above are Venus and her son Mercury who participated in these studies. Uh, then uh, we adopted them. We had to go all the way to the provost to get permission to adopt them because the, the university was concerned, well, what does gene therapy do? Will we um, spread the gene elsewhere? But we convinced them that wasn't the case. And they lived out their lives still seeing, chasing swirls to the very end. Um, the other um, curveball that the FDA threw us when we were planning a registrational trial, um, we planned on injecting um, uh, 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 one set of patients and, and following them for the one-year point. They said we had to use controls with, um, non -in uh, with uh, excipient injected controls. Well, we persuaded them that we wouldn't have to inject them, that we could follow them over the year um, um, and then cr they would cross over and receive in injection in the intervention group. And meanwhile, the intervention only group would be have both eyes injected and be followed for a year. And then the primary endpoint would be red. Um, we, if we had had to designate people to a control group without any prospect of benefit, we were worried we wouldn't get anybody because the word had spread that this um, was an effective treatment. And then lack of relevant outcome measures for phase three. For phase three, to get a project approved, you have to pre-specify what your outcome measure will be. And um, up until that point in time, the only approved outcome measure is reading letters on the eye chart and improving by three lines in reading those letters. Well, what happens if you can't even see the eye chart? Or what happens if the um, fovea is not injected? That's, that gives us our vi fine visual discrimination, our visual acuity. Um, we were worried that this would not be a sufficient outcome measure. And um, so we asked the FDA, what can we do? And they said, use a functional measure of vision. They didn't give us any more um, information than that. 
Well, we realize with the dogs and with the children in, the, in exploratory measures that being able to navigate safely and efficiently um, and quickly with, without bumping into obstacles could be an outcome measure. So we, um, we upgraded our mobility test, made multiple versions so people couldn't memorize it, gave it at multiple different levels, and went through a validation study to show that this was effective. And this was our primary readout um, for the phase three clinical trial. And you can see here the uh, results um, in uh, one patient um, at baseline compared to the, the two-year time point. Uh, right. There was actually efficacy at the 30-day time point, which has persisted. You see the person goes off course immediately, um, is reguided, he shuffles along the way blind people do because they kick to make sure that there are no obstacles in front of them that they could trip over and um, goes off course Stop. again. And um, whereas at year two after intervention, he navigated the course accurately and quickly found the end of the course um, in, in record time. So um, I, the, the, what this graph shows are the results that led this drug to be approved. When, and uh, the um, y-axis shows improvement on this mobility test and the x-axis shows time. And the intervention group is the dark blue and you can see um, at baseline, they're at one point, day 30 after injection, they are so much more, uh, so much better at this mobility course, whereas the control group in yellow does not improve until both eye, they cross over and both eyes are injected, and then they improve um, to the same extent. And this has been maintained now um, more than five years and counting. Um, and how Hello. does this affect an individual? How are you? Shown here is I'm one of our you? clinical trial Very subjects who um, <laughs> What's your name? Um, My name is sings, Christian and he, he, um, he uh, okay. went to the Apollo Theater Show and he performed all over the, the, the country, but had to be okay. led on stage prior to his gene therapy because he couldn't see where he's going and didn't want to fall off the stage. He'd stand there, could not see people in the audience, but ended up winning America's Got Talent and went forward and came, went very far in American Idol, was in top seven. So that's how, how it affects, it, it, like one, it's an example of how it affects one individual. And he's gone on to his a very successful singing career. Um, and uh, so the drug was approved in December 19, 2017, which, and it's the first um, gene therapy that was approved in the United States uh, to treat a genetic disease and the first gene therapy worldwide to treat a retinal disease. Um, the European Medicines Agency approved it shortly thereafter. What, one thing that surprised us is that we had asked for approval from ages four years old and up, but both the FDA and the EMA said, let's give it one year old and up because hopefully we can prevent these people from actually even suffering from any blinding disease. And so far, um, it seems like that is working. So there was a race um, to uh, give Luxterna by prescription right after it, it was approved in the United States. Shown there is Monroe, four years old, who was treated at Children's Hospital LA, who was brought out to trick or treat, but she had no interest in getting the candy. She just was thrilled that she could run outside in the dark and, and be able to see. Nine-year-old Creed achieved his lifelong dream of pouring away his blind cane, and 13-year-old Jack um, was more cerebral, told about being able to see what the teacher was writing on the whiteboard, et cetera, and ride his bike really fast. So what are the questions now? How long does this last? So far, as I mentioned, it's been more than five years. Um, what if it disappears? Well, we we're hopeful that it's not going to disappear, but we've done additional studies in animals to see it, if it's possible to readminister to the same eye in case we need to redose. And the, what those pictures show is yes, it is possible there's no inflammation you, and you get extra expression. This is in monkeys, um, not humans. Um, but we are really hopeful that we won't have to do that. And shown here is the reason why. This is that first dog I showed you, Lancelot. 
Um, you can see in his retina the white round, kind of uh, glowing round spot. That's where he was injected. And if we look at the cells in that portion of the eye, there are, there's a very thick layer of photoreceptors, whereas the uninjected part, which is shown down below, has no photoreceptors remaining. So that was 10 years after injection. We're hoping that the same thing will happen in humans. Um, there, are, there is experience now post-marketing. Um, one group has reported some atrophic changes in the choroid and, um, and, uh, and we don't know what the explanation is, but we want to figure this out, whether it's some sort of con common in infection or whether it has to do with the stage of the disease or the type of mutation, et cetera because um, we don't want to see this happen in other people, although it has not affected the vision. These people have all improved vision. It's just an appearance sort of thing. There are interest in de delivering gene therapy from different routes so that it could be an office procedure and not somebody lying down on an operating table having the subretinal injection. So there's work in terms of trying to give this reagent in the center of the eye or what's called in the suprachoroidal space that's behind uh, in an artificial space uh, underneath the choroid. And there are trials going on right now which are looking at those different approaches. It may also be possible to generate a recombinant virus which targets those cells. It homes to them by altering the surface pro proteins of that virus so that, yes, you can do an individual injection in the office and it will go to the back of the retina. Um, there are, one, one of the disease targets which has been really difficult to approach are, is, are those that involve very large genes or uh, transgene cassettes with, with long regulatory sequences because the vector we're using, AAV, has a strict cargo capacity of 4.8 kb. Some of those genes are much larger than that. So there's some very interesting ways um, of overcoming those by splicing together messenger RNA, splicing together DNA, or using what are called intines to splice the proteins. And those will be entering clinical trial very, very soon. And um, there's a question about uh, using the right outcome measures. We were really lucky to spend time selecting one that we thought was going to be really work for our disease. There are a couple of gene therapy trials which have failed because they chose the wrong outcome measures. Very simple. And that's a complete waste of, of resources, time, patient's time, and, um, and basically you have to go back to the beginning to approach this. Uh, we want to make something even better than our physical mobility course. And here I've sped it up so you can see some of the problems with this course, that um, there are actual physical obstacles. People can trip over them. Somebody has to be there to make sure they're not going to trip. Um, blind people learn how to echolocate. They can tell where a door is, for example, um, so that they can hear that. Uh, the, the videos are sent to a reading center, which grades them. There's a risk of divulging confidential identifiers and in, um, personal information and bias in terms of, um, of grading these samples, and it takes a long time to grade them. Plus, it takes a, a lot of effort to set up these courses, and you can only do a few tests in one um, afternoon with this. So um, uh, we have been exploring the opportunities provided by virtual reality testing. You can now buy a headset and controllers for $300 where you can actually set up your obstacle course and different luminances. You can control one eye versus the other. It's objective. It's scored immediately by the computer and the headset, so there's no bias and it's quick. You don't need a reading center. Um, and you can do many, many, many tests in a short period of time. And, um, and I, I got uh, very interested in this thanks to my sister, Nancy Bennett, and her spouse, Jennifer Van Dyke. Nancy and Jen were developing virtual reality for the NFL for people in the stadiums to go and pretend that they were a quarterback in a game. Uh, and um, Jean said, why don't you try virtual reality? And Nancy said, why don't you try virtual reality? So we are working together now to optimize this and uh, shown in this video is a colorized, bright um, uh, uh, demonstration of a person going through this test, identifying objects um, by 
touching them and clicking on them so that we can score this really quickly and easily. And this actually works. Shown here is a test case a person with unilateral retinitis pigmentosa. We can distinguish the affected eye for, versus the other one, um, as you can see by the difference in graphs there. Um, there's now gene editing. Um, and in fact, the eye was the first organ that um, CRISPR-Cas was delivered to. Unfort and, and it looks very, very promising. In fact, one of, uh, several of the patients were, were injected at our center by Albert McGuire. Um, unfortunately, Editas recently announced that they're going to um, stop doing uh, these two clinical trials. So I'm hoping that somebody else will pick them up. There are now um, gene therapy programs targeting different pathways. Um, one of those is neovascular disease, which is involved in a number of different blinding diseases, including age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, vascular uh, uh, retinal vein occlusion, retinopathy of prematurity. And by adding um, the genetic instructions for receptors of the, the, the um, inciting uh, molecule, one, uh, it looks like one can block the disease. And these trials are in late stages, so we'll see at some point soon. There are now trials that are, have been initiated, uh, one by Sparing Vision, to um, treat retinal degeneration in a gene agnostic manner by delivering a gene which keeps the cone photoreceptors healthier longer. And there, believe it or not, there, is ev there are even five different um, sites which are doing what is called optogenetic therapy. That's for completely blind retinas where a optogenetic molecule is delivered to the retina to render the remaining cells light sensitive. And it, the first report shows um, promising results. One, one of the challenges, of course, is pricing. And we're all aware of the high prices of approved drugs. Um, the Luxterna that I told you about is now goes for 850,000. The second gene therapy reagent, which was approved, which goes for spinal muscular atrophy, is 2.1 million. And more recently, a drug for hemophilia was uh, put on the market for $3.5 million. Um, how are we going to be able to pay for these as a society? And I just want to have a disclaimer. I have nothing to do with drug pricing. And I understand the reasons um, why these prices can be high, because it's a one-time treatment and you know, it can get, improve quality of life dramatically and free people from repeat treatments and so forth. But this is going to be a challenge. And, um, and how, how are we going to make the cost of developing these treatments less? Well, one approach is potentially uh, one that we followed early on was to do this as an academic collaboration. And when you get to the really expensive studies, to um, join forces with a company. And, um, and uh, there are now many, many companies that have been set up that are doing ocular gene therapy. And not all of them are small. A lot of those that you'll recognize there are big pharma. So. Um, so these are the current challenges as I see it um, in terms of the, the current economic situation, um, which affects all of us, but also the, the ability to move forward on some of these techni technical issues, um, particularly that companies are now laying off personnel and halting projects and being bought. Um, but hopefully this is an opportunity for, for other groups to be able to take on the projects and also um, give a boost to academia. So it's a really, ex I want to leave you with the fact that it's a really, really exciting time for ocular gene therapy. The, these are all the diseases which are in clinical trial now with different forms of, uh, due to different um, mutations in different genes. And um, the, the trials and gene therapy are now being administered all over the world, in South America, the Middle East, Australia, Asia, over the US, um, and using multiple strategies. And I just mentioned a number of those strategies. And um, in fact, in the United States, uh, gene therapy trials have occurred in the vast majority of states. 
um, and shown in yellow are the only states which have not run a gene therapy clinical trial yet, and were included subjects in a trial, including Alaska, Idaho, Maine, Louisiana. But these are all the numbers of, uh, of uh, studies that have been that have been activated and are in progress, uh, uh, approaching blindness from ages one year old to the 90s. Um, AAV is by far the winner in all those, uh, those different studies. And so my predictions are that the number of trials will increase, we'll somehow figure out how to get a hold of the economic situation, but it's such a promising time. So many different approaches now um, uh, have the potential to change people's lives um, for the better. And um, my view of gene therapy right now is that we're, it will follow the path that monoclonal antibodies have followed, and that path is shown in this diagram, and that we're somewhere at that inflection point where um, in the future, the, um, somebody will be told, oh, you have choroideremia, you need to have this drug, or you have achromatopsia, here's this drug, that there will be a treatment for these diseases which right now are devastating. So I'd like to thank you for attention, your attention. We um, have been so lucky to be involved in these studies, and, um, and like all good science, um, many of the learnings, um, we, we relied upon the things that other people learned, uh, learned to be able to apply them, and hopefully others um, are doing that as well from what we've learned. And we are very, very thankful to all the families and the, the collaborators, clinical trial participants, and of course the animals who led the way, and, uh, and of course our sponsors. So thank you very much.